Hello and welcome to Viewpoints. My name is Kathleen Kiernan and today I have the privilege of interviewing a friend and a colleague, Roby Sen. Roby, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you and thank you for inviting me. Of course. This is a class on special topics, as you know, and I think it's fascinating time-wise that it's April Fool's Day and we're going to talk about fools, spies, pranksters, and privateers. So let's talk about the internet. Is this a new frontier, really? New rules of engagement? Well, I mean, certainly the internet is new. Um, but, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about uh, in our presentation is that there is a trend where we see criminal behavior, um, espionage, sabotage, vandalism on the internet because the, the medium is new. Mm -hmm. We think somehow the problem's new. And we think we have to deploy new tools um, when in reality, many of the problems we're seeing in um, the internet and our networks are problems that the law enforcement, uh, national defense community actually understand well. If they would get past this um, kind of fear of the newness of the medium, which yeah. is the internet. So it's the cyber security as a genre that make people intimidated thinking, intimidated thinking it's something new versus using a method to disrupt an organized crime group or things like that. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's this almost a, you know, as a, with Arthur C. Clarke had this quote that uh, any advanced technology is indis indistinguishable from uh, magic. Mm -hmm. I probably uh, misphrased the quote, but that's the gist of it. And I think for a lot of people, especially policymakers and leaders who don't have this technology background, who haven't been brought up um, with technology, it all seems very complicated, uh, voodoo, dark magic. And I mean, it's, it's not trivial, it's not simple, but it is not uh, something that, you know, you need some special high priest or magician to come in. You don't need a rocket scientist or a physicist to explain it to you. Um, and I think there is this big fear. We need to get over that. And I think one of the big problems is law enforcement and national security needs people who understand that community, who are from those communities to help guide them. So isn't this interesting? We technically or traditionally look at look for expertise within our own bureaucracies or organizations, and your premise is we should look outside. Perhaps the very people that at some juncture we might chase after, we may want to enlist to help us think about a hard problem. Yeah, I, I think... Um... You know, we the, the um, law enforcement, national security, whatever, have approached, you know, those people who, you know, the Kevin Mitnicks of the world who, if you, if you don't know, was a famous hacker um, who did a lot of social engineering and, and really kind of teased law enforcement and the people were after him. Um, and he was punished, I think, uh, too, too, too much for, for the situation. But putting that aside, you know, law enforcement stuff consults with him. They reach out to him. They talk to him. But I'm not talking just about reaching out to the criminals. I'm talking about, uh, or people who have committed uh, some kind of shady, uh, you know, gray area, black area of the law. I'm talking about reaching out to people who live in that domain, um, who have been raised in that culture, and people who are, are kind of um, different thinkers, out-of-the-box thinkers. And there's communities of these out-of-box thinkers that we call hackers. Um, and so I think law enforcement and national security is afraid of them in part because of popular culture. I mean, 1983, we had a great movie come out called War Games with Matthew Broderick. Of course. I, I loved that when I was a kid. But there were people in government who started to believe that if you just whistled into a phone, that somehow you could take over a computer network. Um, and that somehow then that, that said hacker could start a nuclear war. And that's, that fear has stuck with us, that boogeyman of the evil hacker, and it's just not the case. What's the motivation for a hacker to work with the government? Well, I mean, uh, there's, there's a lot who, who won't. They're not interested. Um, they're distrustful of the government for whatever reason. But a lot of people that we call hackers, um, and just a real quick point, I think, you know, one of the things that's been lost because of, of mass media is that hacker started out as a very positive term a term of respect for people who were innovative thinkers, out-of-the-box thinkers who came up with interesting and new novel solutions to a problem and make things do things they're not supposed to. For example? Um, you know, for uh, example, um, uh, you know, uh, this, is, this is kind of a, uh, a prank, but also very interesting. 
in, um, I think, uh, MIT has a, a history of playing pranks, like April Fool's jokes, of on um, campus. And uh, an epic one was the so-called Green Building. Some uh, young men figured out how to um, get all the uh, um, uh, windows have lights installed in them of different colors so they could turn the building into one big Tetris game. And they played Tetris and everybody could see it on the campus. So that's not particularly um, you know, maybe beneficial to society, but it's a very interesting um, uh, kind of clever um, prank. And that's how a lot of hacks start, um, as uh, uh, people just trying to have fun, enjoy themselves, and understand something complex and come up with a solution. Most hackers aren't there with the idea of solving some deep problem. They're mostly doing um, what you could really call blue sky research and engineering just for fun, trying to have a good time. Roby, what changes the dynamic, the amateur, outlier, young man or woman who is trying to do interesting, innovative things that maybe the traditional classroom or in an educational environment here doesn't provide? What makes the turn to um, criminal? Efforts. To a criminal? Yes. Well, that, that's, that's, that's very hard. And um, once again, I think that there's lots of good academic research on the psychology, the socioeconomics of why people turn to crime. The major motivations are uh, finance. And if you look outside the U.S., that is certainly the case. You look at uh, um, parts of Asia, Europe, Africa, where um, we see large criminal networks, Brazil, the, the motivation is there's no work, there's no jobs. So bright people are attracted to doing these, uh, stealing of, of data, theft, even directly money. Um, but there are uh, groups of people who turn to the criminal side of hacking because they're motivated by uh, politics, ideology. Um, sometimes they are they're, uh, just want to do it for vandalism. There is... A, uh, unfortunately, quite a lot of people who want to destroy things. But you can understand how most of the time they do this because they want attention. They're trying to trying to feed a sense of identity that they feel powerless. And this be is relevant, they express. really. They want to be relevant. They want to be relevant. And I'll say with the criminals um, that this is very common as well. That many of the criminals who are, you know, stealing your credit card data, break into your bank account, steal your Yahoo. Um, I've actually talked to many of these people um, through a variety of means and engaged with them, and you find that often they they want you to like them. They want you, you know, what we'll usually start talking about is how they did it. And one of the ways I entice people oftentimes to talk about it, I say, well, that's not, you know, very hard. Or that wasn't. That doesn't seem like very hard. It seems pretty simple attack. And so then they try to impress you. And what it really comes down to is they want your respect. They want to feel relevant. They want to serve that sense of identity. And um, many of those same people would be willing and happy to come to the light side, we could say, if there was an opportunity for it. Um, and that's, that's a lever that you can play in this game. Interesting. Here at the center, we talk a lot about the nature of big threat. So we talk about 9-11, of course. And if you read the popular press, they talk about the equivalent in cyberspace, digital 9-11, digital Pearl Harbor. Is that an overblown threat? Well, I mean, it, it, there, there are definitely some real concerns. Um, and the kind of damage one could do, though I think in the cyber realm, is not attractive to the people who want to cause, you know, the kind of damage like a normal terrorist would do, because what they're really looking for is spectacular body count. Um, what you can do in the cyberspace now, you can cause significant harm, massive disruptive events, but they're not usually turned into body count. They're disruption of network, power, finances. And those are things that more a state actor would do. So that's more of the Pearl Harbor. Those are a concern. Um, the difficult thing here is, the very difficult thing here is, it's really not a technology challenge. Um, the problems that exist that would allow people to do these massive disruptive or harmful events um, are often can be solved through good policy, 
uh, education of people in that realm, uh, closer integration between corporations, organizations, um, law enforcement, critical infrastructure. Public-private sector collaboration. Public-private sector collaboration, unfortunately, is a political problem that is hard to solve because people have a hard time working together. Last question. Mm -hmm. We have a great repository of expertise at here at the center and all of our students that come through. What's your best advice for the first responder human digital terrain toolkit? Well, I think for folks here who are going into this arena who want to understand it, the thing is not tools, not toolkit, is to find a guide. And those guides are out there. Um, you know, we talked about the negative side of the hacker term. It's becoming a much more positive term. We have life hacker, growth hacker, all these companies and websites that are pushing that positive value behind that term again. And what we're seeing is groups of security people, uh, smart, talented, interesting men and women coming together and forming hacker groups um, that focus on kind of discovery and making things for fun and, and interesting. Those people would be highly receptive for many of them, for uh, people like are coming through NPS to come and say, educate me, because that's what they really want to do. They want people to understand what they do and why it's important. And I think that's one of the big missing um, uh, gaps here in policy is engagement with the people who are really the domain experts and live in this in this um, uh, in the kind of digital uh, society. Great answer. Thank you. And we're all about discovery learning here at Naval Postgraduate School. So thank you very much, and thank you on behalf of Viewpoints. Thank you. Thank you.